one, two, one, two. Is this on? <coughs> one, two, one, two. Okay. How are y'all doing? Good. Uh, so, quick question: What is one thing a person must do in Birmingham before they leave? There's one thing that person. Go to Lake Huh? Go to Lake Puro. Go to where? Lake Puro. Lake Puro. Lake Puro. Lady. Lady. Lady Pool. What is Lady Pool? It's a road. It's a road. It's a road. All right. So I'll go to Lady Pool and Chawa. Is there anything to Chawa? Chawa. You know we had a chai competition in my masjid last week. We had everybody bring their best chai, like from different regions of the community. And we had like five people bring daisy chai, different types, Kashmiri chai. And out of all of the different chai, Somali chai won. I even my I made my own patented Sudanese chai bedaban, and I brought biscuits and everything, and Somali chai chai still won. So I was very uh, wanted to do a recount and all that type of stuff. <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to reality. So, Alhamdulillah, Thank you for that chai wala suggestion. So, uh, my topic is a very important topic, and it's a pillar of the religion, which is called the Amr bin Ma'ud bin Big term, scary, underappreciated, often uh, vilified term, but it is undoubtedly one of the great pillars of this religion. What does it mean, the Amr bin Ma'ud bin It's generally translated as commanding the good and forbidden evil. What does that mean? And is that really what an Amr bin Ma'ruf means? Because if, it, if that was what the meaning would, then it would be an Amr bin Khair, or Nahyan is Shah. That's what good means and that's what evil means. Shah is evil and good is... Uh, but there are subtleties in the wording that we want to break down. <coughs> Firstly, have you guys heard of what's called uh, a team of superheroes who are called the Haram Police? <laughs> you guys heard of them? No. Okay, so they're called the Haram police. And they are people who, um, you know, have been in existence for a long period of time. I mean, they've been around as long as I've been alive, I remember. And, and I remember actually a lot of extremism from the Haram police, like very judgmental, very, if you were to give me the top three characteristics of the Haram police, what would they be? Ill manner. Ill manner? Did you say well manner? Ill manner. Ill manner, number one. What's number two? Harsh. Harsh, very good. What's number three? Very good. So, like to expose the public. So, these are three attributes. Who are the haram police? Basically, people who go around saying, this is haram, this is haram, you're haram, you're haram, right? Um, and it was definitely an extremism. And every action will bring about an equal and opposite reaction. And so the pendulum has swung to the opposite extreme, and I believe that's the one that we're in now. And that opposite extreme is, instead of this is haram, that haram, and this is haram, you know, their problem was that they would take things that were differences of opinion, very valid differences of opinion in our tradition, in Islam, and they would make it into a black and white, no discussion issue. And now, we've gone the opposite where they've said stuff is haram so much that now we are completely hesitant to say anything is haram. Even about things that are black and white issues. And so the word haram has become haram. Now, in between this extreme and that extreme is the middle path. Neither is it everything in the world is haram. Neither is it walking on eggshells and being, having incredible trepidation of telling your brother or your sister that what they're doing is something that is not bringing them any closer to paradise. So, in between them is this beautiful pillar of Islam, which is called the Amu bin Ma'ruf and the Commanding Ma'ruf and forbidding Ma'ruf. So, what does that mean? Well, first of all, what does Ma'ruf mean? When something is Ma'ruf, what does that mean? For my Arabic language students, what does Ma'ruf mean? Something is Ma'ruf, what does that mean? No, very good. What else does it mean? Something is ma'ruf. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about what's in dialect. It means to do someone a favor. 
Okay, so do something a favor, which is also very good because it's something that is recognizable. Something that's recognizable to be good. What else? What does munkar mean then? Something that is munkar. Denied. Something that is? Denied. Okay, something that is denied. Something that is hidden. When Yusuf alayhi salam's brothers come from Egypt, he says, Allah says, فَعَرَفَهُمْ وَهُمْ لَهُ Allah says, He recognized them. And they were for him in a state of uh, they were munkirun. Uh, they, they didn't recognize who he was. They didn't recognize who he was. And so that being said, ma'ruf means everything that is recognizable and everything that is known. And munkar means everything that is hidden and everything that is unknown. If we were to use modern colloquial terms, ma'ruf is that which is mainstream and munkar is that which is underground. Ma'ruf is mainstream and munkar is underground. Ma'ruf is mainstream to who? Good, wholesome, decent people. It's what people recognize. It's what people are familiar with. And Munka is that which is unrecognized and unfamiliar to good, wholesome people. Is that what So, the underground is supposed to be a place of weird stuff. Fetishes and just, you know, really random subcultures. That's okay. As long as it stays underground. When you allow for it to bubble to the surface, that's when normalization happens, and that's when problems happen. Because when munkar is unchecked, it will bubble to the surface, and it will increase, and it will spread until the munkar becomes ma'ruf. And so you might have things that you will look to your younger brother and sister and say, and be like, really, y'all are all okay with this? Back in the day, we were not okay with this. Your parents will look at you and say, really, y'all are okay with this? We never used to allow something like this. This is what happens when the munkar turns into, and this is what's called the normalization of sin. The normalization of sin. And that is one of the effects of sin, that when sin becomes pronounced, when it becomes publicized, it becomes normalized. And when it becomes normalized, it no longer becomes recognized as being a sin at all. Our value system cannot change based on society if it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a constant. Zina will always be haram, no matter who pronounces it. The Prophet ﷺ, or rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truthfulness will always be good. Even if everybody turns into a liar. Even if we experience those years that the Prophet ﷺ said that they will, be lie, they will be years that they are deceiving. Years themselves that will be deceiving. In which a believing person or a truthful person will be lied. And a deceitful person will be believed. Even then, truthfulness will always be good. These things don't change. Now, that being said, we are all obligated to command the ma'ruf and to forbid the ma'ruf. Where do we find that in the Quran? So many places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises us for being the best ummah to ever arise from mankind. We're the best ummah. This ummah right here, that's why I don't like when people talk about this ummah sucks, we're this, we're that. Like, no, we're not. You suck. <laughs> we're the best ummah to ever arise from mankind. That's what Allah told me. I don't care what you say any coffee shop, anywhere. We are the best ummah. The Prophet Sallallahu says, Ummati kal matar. This ummah is like the rain. You never know. <coughs> I'm getting goosebumps. He said, this ummah is like the rain. You never know whether its best is at the beginning or at the end. This ummah is in between two brackets. The first starts with Muhammad Sallallahu and the end is with Isa ibn Maryam. This ummah can sleep and sleep and be in a coma. And it still has the opportunity at any point in time to get up running. This ummah is blessed. And this ummah is beautiful. And this ummah is the best ummah to ever arise from mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says why in Surah Ali Imran. He says, Ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'miruna billah. You command the good, command the ma'ruf, and you forbid the munkar, and you believe in Allah. We are an ummah that has existed without prophets for 1300, 1400 years. There's not been a single prophet walking on this earth after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we are the ummah that does the work of prophets. Together, collectively, we are the ones carrying the banner. We are the ones calling people to Allah. We are the ones standing firm against tyranny and oppression. And the greatest oppression is shirk. That's us. And so we, because of that burden that we carry as the Ummah of Muhammad we are the best Ummah. 
That being said, we have this collective obligation. And there are arguments that people use, whether they're arguments that we pronounce or they are arguments that people use when we try to fulfill this obligation. Anytime you try to talk to somebody and you say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I think that you know you should this isn't healthy, this isn't good. What you're doing isn't correct. There are arguments that people have as a reaction. And there are arguments that we convince ourselves. So tell me some of these arguments. Let's work through them together. What are some of these arguments that people have? Why do we hesitate to challenge people or correct people? What are the arguments they hear? What's that? They face backlash. How is that backlash manifested? What do they say? It's my choice. Huh? It's my choice. Very good. You're not a scholar. Everyone's going to their own grade. Everyone's going to their own grade. Great. No one can judge me. No one can judge me. Only God can judge me. Huh? Oh, but you do this. Okay, so these are very good. Let's just stop really quickly. Let's just take the first one. Only God can judge me. Which is also the same as I'm going to my own grave. Like, which is basically worry about yourself, right? So what are the what are the responses that you would have for that? Worry about yourself. You're like, you're right, I should be worrying about myself. My bad, I'm sorry. You'll be judged for not saying anything. Very good. The same one who will be judging you told me that I gotta. I advise you. Same, same scenario here. So Allah doesn't say that. He doesn't say only God. Yeah, He does. He says, on the day of Everyone will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by themselves on the day of judgment in Surah Maria. Why? He also told you to advise each other. And the Prophet said that. That's my obligation. Very good. And there's a lot, of, there's a beautiful hadith to this effect. The symbolism is incredibly beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ says, He says, the example of the one who stands at the limits of Allah and guards the limits of Allah. And the one who transgresses it is like two groups of people who drew lots upon a ship. They drew lots. They ran off. They did a, like a, a lottery. Some people got the upper deck of the ship. And some people got the lower deck. Now the people in the lower deck, every time they wanted water, they have to go up and water the people on top. And so they got the bright idea and they said, why don't we just make a hole in the bottom? That way we'll get access to water without bothering the people on top. And then the Prophet said, if they leave them to do that, they will all be destroyed. But if they take them by the hand, they hold them by the hand, they will all be saved. This is a communal experience where we are, we're all traveling together. And if you just, if I just allow you to wild out in the way that you want to, that's like me allowing you to burrow a hole. It's your choice, right? It's your freedom. But your freedom affects me. And your choices do affect me. It affects my kids. It affects the society that we're going to live in. The values that change in the society affects all of us together. And so this example, the Prophet says, if they hold them by the hand, however, they'll all be saved. So, yes, Allah will judge you alone, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made this earthly experience that we are all in together, He made it a communal experience. And He made each one of us a fitna for each other, and a trial for each other, and a test for each other. Very good. What was the, the next one? We had, so we had, don't judge me, we had, it's my choice. It's my choice. Very good. So it's my choice has, it's coming from like a, a very uh, interesting perspective. Because do people, including Muslims, criticize other people for the things they say and the things that they do? Yes or no? Yes. But what's interesting, and they will do it in the most aggressive ways. They will get people fired from their jobs, and they will get people banned from all sorts of institutions and all of that. But the code that they are using is not the Qur'an and Sunnah. 
the code that they're using is liberal morality. And so if you say something that goes against the Quran and Sunnah, that's your freedom and that's your choice. But if you speak against liberalism, or if you hold views that are considered to be racist, or considered to be patriarchal, or sexist, or xenophobic, or homophobic, or what have you, then what happens? And so the Haram police hasn't changed. They've simply changed their rule book. They've changed their guidelines. And so when people say, it's my choice, that's a person who is removed themselves from Ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and it is not befitting for the believers, that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger has decreed an affair, that they have any khira in it, that they have any choice in it. Allah is the one who removes choice from us. If you're going to be a servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so conditioning ourselves to be ready to accept advice when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Number three was, you're not a scholar. You're not a scholar. Question, do I have to be a scholar to tell somebody to do something or not do something? Do I have to be a scholar to tell somebody, you didn't pray five days, you should pray? Do I need to be a scholar for that? Do I need to know the position of the Hanafis and the Shafi'is and the Madhis and the Hanbalis? And Ahlul Birmingham and Ahlul London and Ahlul, right? I don't need to know that. Absolutely. But that is a good point. And that point is, there is no, and this is an important thing to know, there is no, um, there is no nahi, there is no for, uh, forbidding when it comes to issues of valid difference of opinion. When it comes to an issue of a valid difference of opinion, I can't prevent somebody. You are in Birmingham, and so you believe that the only halal meat that you can eat is the biha. And you guys probably have like, Layered levels of Zabiha. You have like, you probably guys, I'm sure you guys do it here. But you know what? It is a valid opinion that the food of the people of the book is halal for you. And so if you see a Muslim eating a mink chicken, you don't take their mink chicken and throw it in the trash. Am I offending your sensibilities here? It's a valid difference of opinion. Whether the basmala is a requirement in the slaughter or not. There are people who believe it is, and there are some people who don't. And as long as Britain is still a Christian country, there's still a Hajjah. Is Britain still a Christian country? When that switches, when that switches, then that ruling will switch. But as long as Britain, the majority of Britain are Christian, what type of Christian, whatever, it's still a valid position to hold. So to speak, you can't eat their meat because they're a majority atheist. Yes. What about those who pick and choose then? Um, so they follow every, everything regarding a certain school and thought, but when it suits them, then they decide well, to Well, that's, that's at their own peril, right? A person who seeks out concessions, a person who seeks out ruhas, the scholar said that person will end up becoming a heretic, will end up becoming a zindir. You're not, you don't just pick and choose. You follow a scholar. You follow a teacher when you don't know that you go and you ask. And then once you ask a person, you've done your due diligence of seeking out the best person, then you bind yourself by what they say. You don't go fatwa shopping, as they say. You don't do that. But if a person just sits there and goes and seeks out the permissible positions of every faqih, every jurist, then they're going to end up practicing something that isn't Islam. Okay. So, you're not a scholar. But my point here is that there is no nahi when it comes to issues of ikhtilaf. There's a valid ikhtilaf. If there isn't a valid ikhtilaf, or if the ikhtilaf is incredibly weak, a person comes up to you and says, this particular companion allowed muta. What is muta? Muta is a temporary marriage where a person just agrees with someone and they say, we're going to be married for seven days. Because we have exams. That person it is not allowed by all of the companions except for a very few, and after them, all of the scholars all agree that it is law. So first you can't turn around to say that is a law, right? Examples like that. Anyway. Then we have another very popular uh, response, which is, worry about yourself. And then after that is, we are all at different levels of iman, all at different levels of faith. Who are you to judge me? You don't know my journey. You don't know where I'm coming from. 
And that's absolutely true. I don't know if you've started practicing yesterday or if you've been practicing for 10 years. If I do know, that should change my, my reaction. The fact that we are all at different levels of faith and different levels of Iman doesn't remove the obligation. All it does is it means that I have to alter the tools that I use. I've got to bring out my toolbox and instead of using a hammer, there might be some people that I use a hammer for. Like for example, if it's someone very close to me, like my younger brother, and he knows better, and he knows he knows better, and I know he knows better. That is somewhat, and he will listen to me, because he's my younger brother. I can be harsher with that person than I would be with somebody who's a stranger to me. You know, a person once said to me, he said, we need to be really harsh. I said, why? He said, because Abdullah ibn Umar, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu said no. A man once came up to him and said, I love you for the sake of Allah. And he turned around and he said, I hate you for the sake of Allah. And he said, why? He said, because you are someone who when you recite the Adah, you make it sound like music. Abdullah ibn Umar was one of the strictest companions when it came to following the Sunnah. Abdullah ibn Umar was so strict that if the Prophet did something incidentally, he would try to do it. But, I said to him, we were probably both like 20 years old at the time. I said, so, when Abdullah ibn Umar said that, who is Abdullah ibn Umar first? One of the most prolific narrators of Hadith Ahmed. One of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ. After the Battle of Uhud, he was there every time with the Prophet ﷺ. One of the greatest teachers in the history of Islam. And when he grew up, when he became the elder companion, the entire world was looking to him for his knowledge. So when someone says to him, I love you for the sake of Allah, and he turns around and says, I hate you for the sake of Allah, that person is going to change whatever behavior caused it immediately. Because he has so much cachet, so much currency with everybody. But when you and I, and we're 20 years old, walking around with somebody saying, I hate you for the sake of Allah, they might punch us in the face, man. <laughs> like, all that will do is push them away. Like, these Muslims are jerks. You have no currency with a person. And so for some people, you may need to use a hammer, but for some people, you need to bring out a tweezer. Al-Hasan al Hussein, they gave us a beautiful example of this. The two grandsons of the Prophet, and they were kids at the time, or they were young men. One of them, or both of them saw a man who was making a little wrong. And this man's an uncle, very old. And then Hassan says, walks up to the man. And do they just walk up to him and say, Uncle, ha ha ha, you don't know how to make wudu, let me teach you. We're the grandsons of the Prophet. No, people have dignity and egos, and you have to have to give people an opportunity to save face. I hardly ever, ever correct anybody online. I just don't believe it's effective. I don't see it. I don't see it. You know, people are so aggressive online. They're just so aggressive. You know, uh, it's like somebody will say, uh, I disagree with someone. And then the next person says, if you disagree, then you're the problem. And I just look at them like, where did this escalation come from? Where did this battle, where did this battle go? And I remember one time I was discussing this with a neurosurgeon, and I said to him, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu he talks about socialization and how your social experience affects your personality. The Prophet Sallallahu he says, in a beautiful hadith, he says, Man al He said that whoever lives in the desert becomes harsh. If you live in the desert, you're a Bedouin, you don't know civil discourse. You don't know how to talk, you don't know how to say please and thank you. You become harsh, you become rough. That's if you live in the desert. And so I said to him, I feel like whoever lives on social media lives in the desert. It's the same thing. And then he said to me, social media, he said it was beautiful, he said social media is an experience where we're all alone, calm, together. We're all alone, but we're just all doing it together. And you see this level of harshness because there's no real interaction. And so, Al-Hasan and Hussein are talking to this man. And they say, Oh, both me and my brother are saying that we make wudu better than the other. So can you please judge between us? He says, sure. They've given him his due respect. They've put him as a position as an authority and as a judge. Incredibly clever. And Allah be pleased with them both. Then, 
Al-Hasan makes wudu and he makes wudu perfectly and the man is watching. Then Al Hussein comes and he makes wudu perfectly also and the man is still watching. And then the man says, both of you did wudu correctly and it was your uncle who was doing wudu. But they gave him the opportunity to say things. Don't seek out to embarrass people. That's not the game here. And that's not, that's not anyone's objective. When people are at different levels of faith and iman, then it still requires that obligation. But it just means that I am going to change my approach. I'm not going to treat the person who knows like the person who doesn't know, and I'm not going to treat the person <coughs> like the person who shouldn't know. Any other arguments for why we don't do it? I'm trying to think if, if there's anything left. Uh, you don't know what's in my heart, is that said? I think that's the last one. What's that? You're, you're not 100% sure if what you're going to say to them is actually going to like bring them close, like, correct them on it, or send them further away. Okay, so you don't know if what you are going to say to them is going to bring them close or is going to push them away. My question is, do you ever know? Is there a point where you will ever know? At some point, isn't every piece of advice that anyone has ever given you, isn't it a shot in the dark? Right? And don't you not know how they're going to take it? If they're going to accept it, if they're going to change it? And I think one of the things that also impedes people is that they gauge it by immediate metrics. I spoke to that brother about Salah, he's not praying right now. He didn't listen to me. He didn't listen to me. In your life, have you not experienced things where a person said something to you five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and it's just starting to make sense to you now? And so we are planting seeds. And that's all you're required to do. You are required to plant seeds. And let them grow. But what people do not forget, even if the wording is wrong, what people do not forget is the most important ingredient that I talked about earlier today in my first session when we talk about the art of advice. And that most important aspect is sincerity. People can feel it when you are sincere. And that's why, well, we said this earlier, but for those who weren't here, we said that the people, only the people who aren't here, who weren't here for the first session, you guys can answer. If you were here, then don't pretend to be all smart, okay? Number, the people who are on your back the most, daily, who are they? Your parents. Why are your parents the ones who are constantly advising you? Because they're the ones whose love for you is the most sincere. And so if people feel sincere to them, it becomes bearable. Not only does it become bearable, there will come a time when it becomes appreciated. And that's why Luqman alayhi salam, he told his son, and this is incredible advice, and I end with this. He says, Ya Bunay, oh my son, command the good. And forbid munkar. And be patient with any harm that comes your way because of that. That is from the matters of incredible determination. But it is a beautiful obligation and it is a beautiful, beautiful objective that we be agents of change in any society that we are in because of us having two things that are standard and static and constant, and that is knowing virtue from vice, from the Quran, from the Sunnah of the Prophet And with that, I think we have the right time. Okay, so the light is in the